Hi folks, I am Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix. Discussing the Fabian Big Brother world state, where we'll all be conditioned from birth to death, reconditioned all through our lives. I used a term a long time ago from the Fabian Society, and many of their members used it. They had their own meaning, of course, when they said continuing education. People thought that was night school or something. But what they were referring to was through all the sciences of media and academia. You would be trained lifelong, upgraded like a computer in a sense, with new programs and how to behave, talk, think, speak, and all the rest of it. Pure science. The Huxleys were famous for their, their uh, literature that they churned out on this coming society, this brave new world, this orderly system. FDR's wife wrote a book after she came back from visiting her heroes in the Soviet Union. And she went out to see Pavlov, just like H.G. Wells. That was the big hero because Pavlov, you see, designed the system for the entire Soviet educational bureaucracy and teachers. He designed the curriculums, how to teach, etc., using sciences, conditioning techniques, and punishment and reward and all the rest. In fact, the whole Soviet Union was run on uh, this kind of basis. They had worker of the week, and they picked someone in a factory because he put more output out than anyone else. And all, all kind of reward-type techniques, little gold stars on your report cards, just like we're using in the West. But anyway, the idea was that humans were just animals with trained responses, or they were born and learned responses. Therefore, they could be rechanged by the state using sciences to create the kind of societies worldwide they'd want, the kind that would allow themselves to be ruled. That was the, tech, that was the whole point of the parallel governments. And we have, over many years, allowed ourselves incrementally, again, true Fabianism is incremental, you see. They never go too far ahead at one go. Almost sometimes, but not too far, not, not often in different areas. They give it to you in one way and let you swallow it, and then sit back for a while and hit you again. Meanwhile, they're already working on the young always, because they're the up-and-coming ones, with their program, with the politically correct ideas that they will think is quite, is quite natural when they grow up into that world where they see those things coming forward. It's all based on science. I've gone through the speeches by Beria of the Soviet Union from the 1930s, where he said it was down to a perfect science in his day, where they could upgrade children every five years ahead and indoctrinate them into new ways of seeing, thinking, and even a different logic could be used. Today it's even quicker because of the communications at our disposal. And therefore what we've come to a stage where with drugs, they've drugged so much of the population, exactly as the Huxley said that they'd have to do to bring this about. They've got school boards involved, picking and teachers picking and choosing who should get put on the Ritalin and all the other offsprings of Ritalin, which shrinks the brain. And it's generally boys with leadership abilities. That is not a coincidence. At the moment, we're going through a phase where they keep us punch drunk, punch drunk with crazy news. And I mentioned patterns of news yesterday. When you see patterns of news come out, that, that makes no sense, or they seem so down, downright silly, where bureaucrats are interfering with people, where laws are being passed to favor rapists and stuff like that. Uh, This is meant to get you punch drunk until, literally, uh, you can't make sense of things anymore. It's a real psychological technique. And again, Pavlov is a guy they give credit to because he used to do this on different animals and prisoners as well, by the way, human beings to make sure that these techniques did work. And they found that when you, when you were just like the dog, when you were shocked in all corners of the room, you didn't know where to go anymore, you just broke down eventually. That's a state of where they can reprogram you. And because you can't trust your own perceptions, your own senses, your own rationale, you go along with what, whichever way you're pushed. And we have such big changes to go through, such massive changes 
in this new global society that literally is not new and was planned an awful long time ago before your grandparents were born, uh, then they have to shock us in so many ways with crashes and terrorism and all that till we're off balance. And then we just go along with the big bully boys when they come uh, and march along the street with their machine guns and their black clad outfits and so on. All for your safety, you understand. Associations, you see, are very handy to have because one leader can be put in who control the minds of millions of people. That's why they encourage associations and massive groups to form. But propaganda, as I was talking about earlier, is a technique that's used. Bertrand Russell talked about using, bringing in Madison Avenue, the big advertising companies, the ones who really understood how to alter the behavior of people by persuasion, mainly by understanding their weaknesses. And once you understand the weakness, you can exploit that weakness. And they did bring the big marketing companies on board. They combined it with behavioral psychology and the Skinner types of uh, behaviors, um, basically reprogramming through Skinner ideology. Now, a lot of that does work, and Skinner got his ideas, too, from Pavlov and others had gone before him, people who are big heroes in the scientific milieu. And yet, when you look at what they were doing, they were really psychopathic sadists, because anyone who can experiment with dogs like Pavlov, and humans, by the way, as well, and stick things in their brains and punish them and shock them, and stand by like an insect observing its prey. It's not totally human. There's something absent in their head. But what makes it more dangerous is that Pavlov and Skinner and all these characters were heavily funded by big foundations. Heavily funded. Massively so. Foundations that have gone through wars, fomenting wars, financing Nazism. They also financed the birth and the maintenance of the Soviet system. And these foundations are on today, go on today. They're never punished. You see, they're untouchable because behind them are very old families that really run the world, including royalty. And now, in chapter 7, I'm going to read some of the Material that really interested Aldo Huxley and others of his ilk because that was their speciality. Mind control and brainwashing. He goes on to say, in the two preceding chapters I have described the techniques of what may be called wholesale mind manipulation as practiced by the greatest demagogue and the most successful salesman in recorded history. But no human problem can be solved by wholesale methods alone. The shotgun has its place, but so has a hypodermic syringe. In the chapters that follow, I shall describe some of the more effective techniques for manipulating not crowds, not entire publics, but isolated individuals. In the course of his epoch-making experiments on the conditioned reflex, Ivan Pavlov, oh Pavlov, boy I'll tell you, this guy was a psychopath par excellence, Uh, and a hero to these guys, to all these psychologists. Ivan Pavlov observed that when subjugated to prolonged physical or psychic stress, laboratory animals exhibit all the symptoms of a nervous breakdown. Refusing to cope any longer with intolerable situation, their brains go on strike, so to speak, and either stop working altogether, the dog loses consciousness, or else resorts to slowdowns and sabotage, the dog behaves unrealistically, or develops the kind of physical symptoms which, in a human being, we would call hysterical. Some animals are more resistant to stress than others. Dogs possessing what Pavlov called a strong excitatory constitution break down much more quickly than dogs of a merely lively as opposed to a choleric or agitated temperament. Similarly, 
weak inhibitory dogs reach the end of their tether much sooner than do calm imperturbable dogs. But even the most stoical dog is unable to resist indefinitely. If the stress to which he is subjugated is sufficiently intense or sufficiently prolonged, he will end by breaking down as abjectly and as completely as the weakest of his kind. Pavlov's findings were confirmed in the most distressing manner and on a very large scale during the two world wars as the result of a single catastrophic experience or of a succession of terrors less appalling but frequently repeated, soldiers develop a number of disabling psychophysical symptoms. Temporary unconsciousness, extreme agitation, lethargy, functional blindness or paralysis, completely unrealistic responses to the challenge of events, strange reversals of lifelong patterns of behavior, all the symptoms which Pavlov observed in his dogs, reappeared among the victims of what in the First World War was called shell shock, in the second, battle fatigue. Every man, like every dog, has his own individual limit of endurance. This is a, a tremendous subject to the people who run the world, remember, because they must know how everyone ticks and how to break you, how to condition you to you. So you'll love Big, big Brother eventually, you'll love the Master. Most men reach the limits after about 30 days or of more or less continuous stress under the conditions of modern combat. The more than averagely susceptible succumb in only 15 days. The more than average tough can resist for 45 or even 50 days. Strong or weak in the long run, all of them break down. All that is to say of those who are initially sane. Isn't this interesting, this part? For ironically enough, the only people who can hold up indefinitely under the stress of modern war are psychotics. Individual insanity is immune to the consequences of collective insanity. Isn't this amazing? It's, it's, it's incredibly uh, ancient, it's Babylonian um, in its understanding of the human mind. Because he admits it right in the open, uh, that's even in the Talmud, I think, individual insanity is immune to the consequences of collective insanity. And that's what war is. All this harrying and ya 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 and waving flags and stuff is collective insanity. And more so because the public are quite content with the, the pithy excuses they're given for the wars as the boys in the banks fill up their coffers and add all the zeros behind the figures, the numbers that they're going to collect during the debt or from the debt that's, that's made from the wars. The fact that every individual has his breaking point has been known and, in a crude, unscientific way, exploited from time immemorial. In some cases, man's dreadful inhumanity to man has been inspired by the love of cruelty for its own horrible and fascinating sake. The, this is the pseudo-masochistic personality again. They, they worship those more powerful than themselves, give complete allegiance, but they despise the weak ones beneath them. More often, however, pure sadism was tempered by utilitarianism, theology or reasons of state. Physical torture and other forms of stress were inflicted by lawyers in order to loosen the tongues of reluctant witnesses, by clergymen in order to punish the unorthodox and then induce them to change their opinions, by secret police to extract confessions from persons suspected of being hostile to the government. Under Hitler, torture followed by mass extermination was used on those biological heretics, the Jews, for a young Nazi, a tour of duty in the extermination camp was, in Himmler's words, the best indoctrination on inferior beings and the subhuman races. Given the obsessional quality of the anti-Semitism which Hitler picked up as a young man in the slums of Vienna, this revival of the methods employed by the Holy Office against heretics and witches was inevitable. But in the light of the findings of Pavlov and of the knowledge gained by psychiatrists in the treatment of war neurosis, it seems a hideous and grotesque anachronism. 
stress is amply sufficient to cause a complete cerebral breakdown can be induced by methods which, though hatefully inhumane or inhuman, he says here, fall short of physical torture. Whatever may have happened in earlier years, it seems fairly certain that torture is not extensively used by the communist police today. Well, of course, Huxley and all the big boys that worked for MI5 and 6 had to cover for their Soviet experimental bosses over on the other side there because they were all working together. And there was no real Cold War. It was all laboratory experimentation. And the best laboratory is a totalitarian state. He goes on to say, they draw their inspiration not from the, Inquis- the Inquisitor or the SS man, but from the physiologist and his methodically conditioned laboratory animals. For the dictator and his policeman, Pavlov's finding have important practical implications. If the central nervous system of dogs can be broken down, so can the central nervous system of political prisoners. It is simply a matter of applying the right amount of stress for the right length of time. At the end of the treatment, the prisoner will be in a state of neurosis or hysteria and will be ready to confess whatever, whatever, remember, his captors want him to confess. And that's what you saw or read in George Orwell's 1984. What the intelligent and practical dictator needs is not a patient to be institutionalized or a victim to be shot, but a convert who will work for the cause. Turning once again to Pavlov, he learns that on their way to the point of final breakdown, dogs become more than normally suggestible. This is to be applied to humans, remember. New behavior patterns can easily be installed while the dog is at or near the limit of its cerebral endurance, and these new behavior patterns seem to be ineradicable. The animal in which they have been implanted cannot be deconditioned. That's interesting, eh? In other words, these new patterns that you put into the animal. The animal in which they have been implanted cannot be deconditioned. That which it has learned under stress will remain an integral part of its makeup. Now that's why you find these old fogies that they call veterans that line up in war memorial days with little caps on and their blazers that they get and they wear and they march or they, 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 they toddle really some of them almost fall and they're so proud of what they did and if you ask them about the war they can only repeat the propaganda that was given at that particular stressful period in their young lives they haven't gone beyond it they haven't gone into any other information uh, in later years, they can only repeat the indoctrination that was given them under stress, and that was further intensified by the propaganda they received from their commanding officers and through their bulletins and so on during that stressful period. That's why that works that way. Psychological stresses can be produced in many ways. Dogs become disturbed when stimuli are unusually strong, when the interval between a stimulus and the customary response is unduly prolonged and the animal is left in a state of suspense, when the brain is confused by stimuli that run counter to what the dog has learned to expect, when stimuli make no sense within the victim's established frame of reference. Furthermore, it has been found that the deliberate introduction of fear, rage or anxiety markedly heightens the dog's suggestibility. That's why we're getting all this hype today about terror, terror everywhere and not a drop to be seen. If these emotions are kept at a high pitch of intensity for a long enough time, the brain goes on strike. And that's what you're seeing with the people today of the Western world as they hype up the terror that we don't see happening, except we hear it all the time and we see guys on television or newscasts running around with machine guns dressed in black gear to protect us, very ominous looking people, then that scares the hell out of us, you see, and we comply. But eventually we get so used to it, we want to shut down, we want to turn on something that's that's fun, 
so we watch a movie or a soap or whatever they, you watch to escape. And, and that's why that works. We, we stop, we stop. And as that happens, they can go the next step with terror and the next step with taking your rights away. This is all planned this way. See, there's nothing that's happening today that wasn't planned and understood 50 to 100 years ago. And it did take time to plan all of this. If these emotions are kept at a high pitch of intensity for a long enough time, the brain goes on strike. When this happens, new behavior patterns may be installed with the greatest of ease. They can make you go totally cashless. They can make you carry ID cards. They can make you do things and sign for everything and verify everything and give your whole life story out to everybody who demands it. And you'll do it, you see. That's what's happening today. Among the physical stresses that increase a dog's suggestibility are fatigue, wounds, and every form of sickness. For the would-be dictator, these findings possess important practical implications. They prove, for example, that Hitler was quite right in maintaining that mass meetings at night were more effective than mass meetings in the daytime. During the day, he wrote, Man's will power revolts with highest energy against any attempt at being forced under another's will and another's opinion. In the evening, however, they succumb more easily to the dominating force of a stronger will. And that's why, when I was young, the news came on at 6 p.m. And that's all you got was the news. You didn't get sports and all trivia mixed with horror. You got the basic propagandist news. And that's all it was. It was very authoritarian. And that's how it was presented by the BBC. But as they progressed with the system, the news got later and later, 10 or even 11 p.m., when that that semi-sleepy state, you're more suggestible, you're open to the conditioning. And most people, once it starts, because there's always fear involved, and you always think, I better know what, what the fear is all about, you'll stay there till it's finished, and you're being propagandized in a, in a hypnotic state old stuff they knew this years ago. I've always said we pay for our chains. We pay all. We pay the, we pay the salaries of these, these you know, cyber warfare organizations that are being used against us. We pay for all. And the psychological war and all the, the incredible mayhem that creates too, we pay for all that as well. And you want to vote for these governments? We're all Pavlov's dogs. Do you understand that? We're all Pavlov's dogs. That, that, that evil character Pavlov that Eleanor Roosevelt loved, she went over to see him. <laughs> she thought it was the greatest thing to humanity. The greatest thing since sliced bread, as they say. He was a genius of a man who could modify the behavior of people. You, you, said, you think he, really, he just wanted to train the dogs in a different way? You know? Of course he didn't. He was trying to find out if humans would react to this. And they didn't use, just use dogs, by the way, oh, in the Soviet Union. But, I mean, you see, you're all dogs. You, you've been trained to be fearful. You know? Before that, just take your little, your little bubble of a world, eh? you personally. And your Pavlov's dog. And so, yeah, I can go to the pub and I can have a drink. And I can go here and I can do that. And I can go to the store and I can do, do, do. I can meet friends and eh? a little bubble. But then Pavlov says, okay, um, let's watch what he does now. And you have to do your usual routine. I'll go and see so-and-so tonight. And bingo, as, as soon as you step near this particular uh, uh, person's home or whatever it is where you meet your buddies, you get an electric shock, you know, and uh, down you go. And then you, you get up, well, what, what on earth happened there? And you're still confused in the whole thing, and you stagger back across that, like, down you go again. Eh? 
And then you go back home and you're, and you're really stuck in the And you say, well, well, what's going on here, you know? And then as you get up off your feet from, from, from staggering, the cops jump on you and start beating you up and beating you up and beating you up. So you associate getting beaten up and shocked with not, not to be where you are. See, at that, at that person's house outside. The, so you go home and you say, I'm not going to go back there again. So a few weeks go by, and you, I'll, I'll go to I'll go to, to to Richard's house, right? And so you go to Richard's house, and it's fine, you know, and you back and forth, back and forth, and you go to other pals' houses, but except that one house where you got that, right? Then one day you go to Richard's house, and and you get near the door, and bzzz, down you go again, right? And then the cops jump on you, they beat the beat you and beat you, you see. And then you go back, oh, I'm not going to Richard's house either, right? Eh? So Joe's out and Richard's out, so. And, and step by step, then, then, then for a while it's fine. All the rest of them are fine for a while, right? Until, the, until, yeah, until you get zapped of every one of them and beaten up. Until you, and then the cops say, you yeah, won't beat you up if you go there. And they point you to where you go, and so it's, it's a one little dingy bar somewhere. And say, yeah, okay, I'll go there then, right? Eh? And so you go there and you're complying with the cops. And it's fine for a year or so. Then one night you go in, go in the bar and bzz, you get zapped there as well. And then you have a complete nervous collapse and nervous breakdown like the dogs did. Because now you're, you're being everything that they want you to do. And even then it's not satisfying. You still get punished. So your, your mind collapses. That's all happening to you, folks. Intense, never-ending psychological warfare, including the use, use of the media to terrify you, not just with the COVID stories, but with the reaction of the police in different countries to the general public. It's meant to terrify you into compliance, and you can't please them because they've just started with their demands. It's the same thing. You're a brick in the wall, eh? Do what you're told. Obey the bullies, the the, the real abusers. Hmm? And getting into the Pavlovian stuff. You, again, counterintelligence must must get people off. It's number one, stop them from being unified on anything. Because if you're unified, there's power there. Create all kinds of little differences. Start off with silly things and, and then promote and even pay folk to join it. They do that too at the top. They give you leaders to follow. And then you split up the main group until it's all fragmented. There's no power left, you see, to complain and do something. That happened with 9-11 and the truth movement and, and different movements that came out of that too. That's counterintelligence. That's what you do with it. But have you noticed how many articles with, with professionals, eh? Uh, wear masks, don't wear masks and for, and for months yet, don't wear masks By the top guys, they don't wear face masks You know, you don't need them, only doctors need them The face mask, I'll know it's a doctor wearing this I guess that's the logic behind it, you see Meanwhile, all the, all the masks that were in your own country Were getting sold off back to China <laughs> There was this woman up with the YouTube That was selling crate loads of this stuff back to China Big bucks And leaving nothing in the US Same thing was happening in Canada and in Australia but the time you're, you're no, don't 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 wear face masks. You know, you're supposed to be able to be vulnerable to it and spread it too. Never mind inhale it. Uh, so don't do it. And then suddenly it's ordered. No, do it, do it. Some places are saying do it, right? So before you're, you're, you're police ready to, to, to hit you in the head with a baton, if you even had a mask on, you see, like we well, want to see your face. You know, for cameras, and we want to see your face. And I'm, I'm trying to protect myself and stay alive. That doesn't matter. Do what you're told. Them. You see, eat your porridge, and then you get into the same cops. Where's your face mask? Yeah. See, you're, you're Pavlov. This is a big experiment going on here to, de to destroy your ability to discern and decide for yourself with logic, using logic. This is all Pavlovian technique. This was used in Russia, Soviet yeah, Russia. It wasn't, they weren't trying to find out what they can do with dogs. Uh, they were trying to find out what they could do with humans, and they had human experimentation on big time too, by the way. 
And all the countries in the West sh- shared that, that information because they love all these techniques of control uh, and, and so on. Anyway, when you are assaulted by authority figures demand in fe- in, put you in fear and, and threats of force or, or fines or imprisonment, right? For either doing something one day and not doing it the next and vice versa until you literally can't make it. That's Pavlovian technique. The dog was trained initially to go to, when the bell rung, to go to this corner and there's the food would come in, you see? And it would go on for a little while and the one ring would happen and the dog would do it. Then one day, the ring would go, he'd go over there, but as he was going over there, he'd get shocked before he got the food. So here's the logic. I'm doing the right thing. I'm being good and zap, right? And then you show them where their food is, put the other end of the cage, and they'll go there, there and, and, and do that for a zap again, you see. Until eventually the, the dog doesn't know where you stand. Utterly neurotic, total breakdown. This is psychological warfare. I hope you understand it. Oh, this is really happening. From myself, Alan Ward, this good night to me, your God or your gods go with you.